It's Super Tuesday in China. I'm not sure what that means, but Mr. Jeff Kleintop does. Joining us this morning, the Chief Global Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Jeff, good morning, sir. What's going on in China? Good morning. Well, you know, this is one of the most important political days in China. China's Premier Li delivered the Government Work Report speech. That's not a great title, but it's one of the most important announcements of 2024 for the world's second largest economy. So I listened pretty closely to this last night, or more accurately, I read the English language transcript closely. It announced the GDP growth target for the year and some of the policies for the year. It's often a market moving event. And this time, move was down. The stock market in Hong Kong, composed of Chinese stocks, sank on the news. It was up 12% since January 22nd, thanks to government intervention and some anticipation of this report. But stocks slipped 2.5% today on a relatively lackluster. It wasn't so much the target, which was 5% for GDP growth this year uh, as leaders try to shore up confidence in the economy. But it was the lack of details on how to get there that was disappointing. The 5% target's the same as last year. And Oliver, that's interesting for two reasons. First, it's only the second time in a decade that the target wasn't lowered. China recognizes that it's, as its economy gets bigger, the pace of growth must naturally slow down. The only other time China kept its growth target steady in the last 10 years was in 2018, and that was when it was dealing with the start of the Trump trade war, and it wanted to signal confidence in the face of adverse conditions. It may be doing that again today. Mm. So that was the good news. But the second thing is that the report said support was needed on all fronts to get there, but the report didn't include any of that additional support. How is China going to meet a 5% GDP target when they had to boost their uh, their federal deficit, their fiscal deficit to 3.8% last year? They're only going to target 3% this year. Uh, in 2023, they had an easy comparison to 2022 when zero COVID had shut down their economy. So uh, with no additional fiscal spending, no major moves to boost consumption, and no specifics on solving the real estate crisis, I just don't see how they're going to get there, Oliver. They have a map with an X on it at 5%, but no plan on how to get there. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so they kind of, it sounds like they just kind of have like a default range based on history of what they think they might be able to get to. I mean, 5% pretty low by the standards of the last 20 years. If we run that GDP chart again, gives us good perspective in case anyone forgot about how booming their growth was and how uniquely low this 5% is. Obviously, we popped up from COVID down there in the bottom right a little bit, but still in a general downtrend. So, the thing is that the Chinese stocks, uh, even as GDP was slowing down, weren't terrible the last several years. I mean, they kind of went nowhere. Uh, but lately, of course, they're going down generally. So where, what has changed, do you think, here, Jeff, in the, mar in the market's lack of tolerance uh, for their economy? Well, a couple things. So one of the reasons why stocks actually did okay, even in the early years of economic growth slowing, is because the emphasis was, emphasis was more on the quality and the profitability of that growth, not just on the quantity of it. So companies became more profitable and not just employment agencies, if you will. And so that was good news. But profits have really slumped lately, in part because consumers within China have slowed down. The consumers become the bulk of what drives China's economy, same as most big economies. It's not just government infrastructure spending anymore as it was for for, for some time in the early 2000s. And that means that, well, they're dependent on the consumer and the consumer is plagued by this downturn in the housing market and property where 70% of their wealth is stored. And with nothing in this report on how they're gonna address those concerns in the property market, that really leaves them vulnerable to another year of weak consumer spending. I will note that the uh, Minister of Housing and Urban Rural Development uh, is supposed to speak in the next day or two, and that may reveal more details on what they intend to do about housing, but no major announcements today was pretty disappointing. Okay. Uh, last point on China, Jeff, is should we be thinking about our election impact on them? There's a lot of debate around what approach. Uh, yeah, the, there's certainly Trump a, 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 a tr Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, a little no, bit of ahead, a, an audio on. glitch there. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think certainly higher inflation coming from maybe new tariffs in, in uh, uh, Trump administration or even coming from the Biden administration here in the next six months or so. And what would that mean? I think uh, we've got to look at what happened last time. To recap, back in 2018, during his first term, Trump imposed a 25% tariff on about $250 billion worth of imports and a 7.5% tariff on another $100, $112 billion worth of Chinese imports. And that means a tariff 
overall of about 13% on all goods that were imported from China. But it didn't result in much of an inflation impact for a number of different reasons. And one is because in this chart right here, you can see there was a lot of substitution going on. Basically, uh, the drop in imports to the US from China was exactly offset by the increase in imports to the US from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, which was exactly how much more China exported to those three countries. So the US just imported the same stuff it got from China. It just passed through other Asian countries first to avoid those tariffs. And the same thing could happen again, mitigating the China tariff impact. So I wouldn't jump to any conclusions yet about inflation, the inflationary consequences of new tariffs from China, given how the world tends to uh, maybe do some trade laundering when it needs to. Okay, fascinating. All right, love that chart. Uh, is, there's so much debate around kind of what impact tariffs had. That one seems to be pretty clearly a place where we can say they had some role. All right, uh, let's talk Europe, Jeff, uh, to the inflation side, right? Once you leave China where things are very slow, the main subject is still inflation everywhere else, right? Yeah, that's right. So uh, the European Central Bank's got a meeting on Thursday. Tomorrow's the Bank of Canada. And the market's still holding on to a small chance of a rate cut. And that's partly because German inflation slowed in February, feeding expectations that the ECB would start lowering rates. Lagarde, uh, President Lagarde of the ECB already told us earlier this year that the next move for rates was lower, but it's probably too early to expect it to happen on Thursday. Uh, Germany, France, uh, Spain, inflation's coming down everywhere. And it's actually surprising on the downside. Uh, on a positive note, uh, this chart here is rather interesting. The green part of this chart, this is a breakdown of inflation in Germany. The green portion is transportation costs. Now, remember, we've got this rerouting of ships around Africa rather than through the Suez Canal uh, for much of February. And those costs, while they jumped, really didn't pick up too much here in terms of the actual impact on businesses. So uh, already we're seeing signs of those transportation costs peaking. So that could mean that this uh, 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 manufacturing recovery may continue and we're not really seeing much of a flow through to final inflation from the seaborne transportation costs. So relatively good news there. But I think we're going to hear more uh, of a status quo from the ECB and really still pointing to a June start to those rate cuts. All right. So things going in the right direction still. It seems like the market has coalesced around this summer, June, basically, as the event. Think so? Yeah, that seems like the right No, I mean, obviously, there's a lot that can happen between now and June, but it seems like where inflation will be in the Eurozone, it could be right around 2% at their target at that point, could even be maybe slightly below it, uh, really compelling them to move. So the market still has a high confidence that June is the right date. Uh, and there's even a chance uh, that it could come a little bit before that. But that seems like the right number. And then probably 25 basis points at every meeting after that through the remainder of the year. So we'll have to see what we hear from Powell, uh, obviously, in his uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony in the next couple of days that could influence what happens with the relative currency moves something i know you watch very closely oliver great stuff love it thank you very much jeff klein tom excellent look around the world ecb tomorrow and drone pal too next two days so it's gonna be pretty busy thanks jeff chief global investment strategist charles schwab